right, welcome to the fourth slideshow for Victory Garden. We're going to be looking at June 2011, so the first part of summer for um, the year, and we're going to be examining transition from spring to summer, uh, the Green Guild undergoing some radical changes, the Nightshade and Four Sisters guilds beginning to ramp up production and uh, fill in their beds quite dramatically. Uh, we're going to talk about the benefits and the drawbacks of using wood mulch uh, in your in your garden. We're going to be talking about um, you know some of the mistakes that I made. Of course, uh, we always have to share those. Uh, we're going to be examining the benefits of some of the polycultures, uh, what to do, what not to do, and we're going to be. Uh, trying to get this under 30 minutes, so we're going to start off here on June 2nd, 2011. Um, most of the screen is filled with the Green Guild, or section of the Green Guild. The center is being dominated by our lettuce plantings of salad bowl lettuce, which is heat resistant, uh, or fairly heat resistant, and then it's flanked on the top and bottom by our uh, cooler season crops of arugula and mustard, which are both um, uh, going to seed, they're bolting, uh, the white flowers are arugula, yellow, or, or mustard. And then you can also see that we've got some other plants in here as well. Along the swale, uh, you can, if you've got a keen eye, you can see um, some onions that are planted. And then also a couple sunflowers that are uh, beginning to make their way. Top left-hand corner of the screen, you can see a section of the Nightshade Guild and how much that's already filled in by the beginning of June. We also have more transplanting that we still have to do. These are some perennials. In the center of the uh, tray is Echinacea, purple cone flower, native to North America. This variety is native to Eastern North America. It's a uh, world-renowned medicinal as well as a wonderfully beautiful generalist nectary species. To the left of it is Yarrow. Yarrow is native to Eurasia but is spread out through most of the globe now with uh, human uh, interference and it's a specialist nectary along with being again a world-renowned medicinal as well as a dynamic accumulator that is very aggressive um, but being a dynamic accumulator means it's the ideal candidate for chop and drop so uh, I don't worry about it too much and bottom right hand corner is uh, Roman and German chamomile Roman is perennial German is annual and they are dynamic accumulators also well-known medicinals uh, generalist nectary plants as well as fairly foot tolerant so you'll see a lot of people use this as a, uh, a lawn replacement species and we're hoping to get enough of it going enough seed production that we'd eventually be able to overseed our lawn and start uh, transitioning from grass to um, something a little bit uh, more beneficial to us in terms of nutrient retention and all that other stuff uh, so five days later on the seventh I'm uh, harvesting some vermicompost. Uh, worm castings are one of the top organic inputs you can put into the garden, not necessarily just because of their uh, the fertility that they're going to bring through fertilizer and, uh, or sorry, nutrients. It acts as a fertilizer, which means there's a lot of nutrients. Uh, the organic matter is a uh, perfect home for microorganisms, and that's what you're really adding. You're adding these beneficial microorganisms to the soil. So bringing it's not necessarily something that you're going to have to bring in, uh, you know, a two-inch layer over your whole garden. Although if you could, that would be uh, something to see. But the just a small amount of it tucked underneath our mulch and into that inoculated compost layer is going to be uh, a wonderful way to stimulate more rapid biological activity in the garden. Uh, the biological activity is sensitive to the sun, so I ha you have to try to be fairly quick about harvesting your worm casting so you don't uh, irritate all those organisms you're trying to bring into the garden. Uh, and if your uh, worm species is not native to your area, like ours, ours is from, I think they're European, Icenia fetida, um, you, you should take at least some, you know, really should take precautions uh, as to introducing them into the environment, even though they are a decomposing worm, not an earthworm, uh, they require a lot of decaying organic matter to survive. They don't burrow into the ground. Um, and I know in Michigan and some other places, I think it's Minnesota, 
uh, where there were forests that didn't have any worms whatsoever. Uh, but after Europeans came, we brought along worms, and now they're completely uh, destroying some of these very unique habitats. So uh, when, when you harvest your worm castings, it's sort of like a dual uh, system. So you, you do it initially, and then you keep them until any castings or worms grow large enough and hatch uh, so that you can screen it one more time uh, to, to minimize the introduction of these uh, non-native species. Um, here's a skink just climbing up one of our trees. It's an excellent animal to have in your, uh, in your garden. Lizards, attract as many lizards as you can. They're going to eat all kinds of bugs. So they're, uh, But I think they're mostly beneficial considering that the herbivores that you're trying to uh, control are at much higher population. So they're going to be getting those more than they're going to get your uh, beneficial organisms. Next photo is the green gill. Look at the structural diversity that's uh, you know changing the physical uh, aspect of this section of the garden with the bolting plants. The bolting plants are providing a new niche for spiders. They're providing nectar. Uh, so there, not only is it visually interesting to have different heights of plants in your garden, but uh, it's also a, a good way to start filling in those niches. The lettuce, as you can see, is forming a pretty good uh, living ground cover in and of itself, so we really could have transplanted more in between. I did seed onions in there, but the onions just did, our onions onions have been a failure uh, for us recently. They just haven't done very well. Next photo, uh, section of the nightshade guild. Um, you can hear I'm sort of coming down with the cold, so don't mind some of the sniffles and everything else. At the bottom of the screen, we've got crimson clover that is beginning to flower, uh, fixing nitrogen, bringing in some phosphorus and some other nutrients along the swale, and then uh, that's an excellent one to have. Uh, crimson clover is an annual, self-seeding annual, uh, and it, it's providing multiple functions, whereas the cosmos on the left is really just a one-hit wonder with its nectar, uh, and it, it's, it's really an uh, aggressive plant in terms of its seed production. And the tomato in the center is uh, looking pretty healthy if it's not. Uh, we, we caged our tomatoes a little bit too close, uh, the cages to the plants. Uh, but they still produced. Here's some cherry tomatoes that are beginning to uh, take form on some of our indeterminate vines. This is a cantaloupe that was afflicted probably by a, n a number of factors. Uh, first, I think, is a disease. But initially, I thought it was a lack of water, so we tried watering it more and it uh, didn't really perk up. So sometimes plants can look like they're wilting from the sun, but you have to look at the neighbors. It's sunflower to the left of it looks real strong and healthy. It doesn't look like it's lacking water. Um, and cantaloupes are supposed to love full sun, although the black mulch is going to increase the air temperature uh, even more beyond the 100 degrees that it would get every once in a while. Uh, next photo, here's just some cucumbers that are ripening underneath uh, in, in the shade of the canopy that they create. Here's uh, a section of the Four Sisters Guild that was double dug last. Um, remember these were transplanted, all the corn was transplanted out and everything else was planted by seed. Uh, didn't This guild didn't do too well uh, and part of that is due to the wood mulch. And I told you I was going to talk about wood mulch. And, Wood mulch is a great way to add organic matter. There's a whole lot of carbon there, uh, but organic matter absorbs so much of its weight in water that if you have a new garden like we do and there isn't a lot of organic matter already in the soil, there isn't, there isn't really any stored water uh, in a cover crop in the root zone. Uh, the water infiltration systems like the swales haven't been implemented for a long period of time. Uh, so the water harvesting, harvesting strategies aren't there. Um, having a layer of dry mulch on top of the soil that is just really begging for water uh, means that you have to get a lot, a lot of rain or you're going to have to pull the mulch back and water because you can empty five gallons around one plant, uh, you know, one of these mounds, and you move a half an inch down into the mulch layer and it's bone dry. Uh, so... With a new garden like this, maybe this much mulch wasn't as good, but once water did get down into the clay, 
it wasn't going to be evaporated by any means because we had the two two to three inches of wood mulch, an inch or two of leaf compost had been amended, and then you had your clay soil. So we were getting the most of the benefits of mulch, but wood mulch can be a a negative aspect in your garden um, initially. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't worried about termites uh, very much. You know, termites usually need larger pieces of wood than small chips. Um, and we've inoculated with so much fungi that these actually, the, the wood mulch is almost gone by the second year. Um, another section of the Four Sisters, these are a lot larger. They were transplanted earlier and they look pretty healthy. The bottom of the screen, bottom right hand corner, you can see a clump of four corn plants that are a lot smaller. They're smaller because they're receiving some shade from a birch tree, um, which you'll see in another photo. Let's go on to another day, almost a week later again on the 15th, and green guild one more time. Uh, I think I'm going to pause here for a second and tell you why I'm planting so many annuals. Um, instead of a lot of the cover crops and uh, other initial pioneer plants that you're going to do if you're trying to transition to a food forest. And that is because, one, I wanted fresh vegetables. Two, I'm new to gardening. And being new to gardening, new to horticulture, uh, you don't necessarily have the ability to uh, distinguish between very healthy plants, uh, you know, Plants that are doing well, but they could use uh, a different location. Uh, plants, you know, just basically everything to do with plants. You're gonna, I think, you're gonna learn a lot more, a lot quicker by looking at the annuals and looking at how they respond to the different microclimates, uh, the different soil conditions, the different water regimens, the different amount of mulch, etc. That because they grow so much quicker, you can see their response uh, within a season. Whereas a perennial may take a little bit of time before it necessarily shows you whether or not it likes to be planted there. Uh, so we were able to distinguish where our microclimates were a lot easier by painting with a large polyculture brush of annual vegetables initially uh, to gauge their reaction to the different uh, parts of the garden. Um, some of you may disagree with doing something like this, but uh, that's what we did and we learned quite a bit from it. Um, next photo here, just taken from the same position on the deck, you can see that the maple tree is casting some shade onto our tomatoes. Those tomatoes ended up being the top producers uh, because they were protected from the afternoon sun that was so damaging to most of the rest of this, this garden. Uh, they didn't have to be watered quite as much and they produced uh, much longer than the rest of the plants did. You can see our comfrey that's end capping our swale on the bottom left center. It's growing extremely well. Our sunflowers are getting a little bit larger. Uh, next photo, Green Guild again. Look at how the white clover border uh, footpath plant is just beginning to fill in all along the edge of that double dug bed and then it's slowly coming off into the footpath but it's beginning to encroach a little bit into the, um, the beds themselves which is okay because again it's uh, nitrogen fixers when you cut it it's going to release a little bit of nitrogen from those root nodules and it's uh, accumulating phosphorus so um, it's a dynamic accumulator and a nitrogen fixer here's some compost tea we weren't big into brewing like some people are some people are really really big into it and they know uh, all the ins and outs we were doing basic vermicompost tea and spraying as a foliar feed and then later on when these cheap pumps um, broke down and we just decided that we didn't want to invest anymore in these pumps, we would do soil drenches and we would drench uh, the compost and the, the mulch with this bacterial, uh, high bacteria, beneficial organism tea. And, and that way bring in a little bit of nutrients but also boost once again the population of uh, beneficial microbes. This is the... Uh, newest end of Four Sisters gets a lot of shade from the oak tree, but also a lot of the midday sun. The reason these plants are so small again is because they were transplanted late and they're already tasseling at only a few feet high. It was an utter failure. Uh, 
you know, that was just one of the worst things that happened. I felt really bad about doing it. Uh, but again, uh, once we get into July, you'll see where we had some storm damage and it wouldn't have mattered if I had, you know, planted these plants out, uh, you know, just by seed uh, or not. Next picture, Green Guild again, different perspective, zoomed out a little bit. And this Green Guild did really well. You can see that the mustards are beginning to be burdened by the seed production and um, are almost on their last leg for the most part. But they're going to be self-seeding for us, so next year we won't have to put out quite as much seed because we have some that's beginning to be acclimated to our local climate. Here's more of the Green Guild, but this is an area that's almost, uh, it maybe gets four or five hours of sun. Uh, so you can see the difference in size, especially the lettuce plants. But the, the white clover doesn't seem to mind one bit because it does well in full sun and part shade. Here's our uh, determinant tomatoes that are coming online. We wanted these uh, to compare with indeterminate varieties. Determinants are meaning they're going to come on in one go. Most of their tomatoes are going to ripen at the same time. They're really good for processing, uh, whereas indeterminate tomatoes are good for just picking and eating fresh throughout the season. Um, we had a lot of fruit that was on the vines, but these never really ripened. And uh, part of that's because of a new garden with like ours, not a lot of organic matter uh, holding the nutrients in the soil. And being, again, being new, there's not a lot of the fungal associates that are going to break down and find the proper nutrients to feed these plants. So there's a lot of nitrogen, which is really readily accessible to the plants from the organic, uh, from the organic, sorry, the cold, the, the organic fertilizer that we used, but bone meal and everything else takes a little bit of time to be broken down by the beneficial organisms and then given to the plants. So they fruit, they set fruit, but they didn't uh, ripen all the way. Here's the cosmos again, showing its ability to be uh, quite aggressive. It's about a meter across if you're looking at the uh, the width including the the flower so you can see just how quickly this would march throughout your garden if, if it doesn't have any competition. Um, it later on got shaded out by these okra plants that are coming up. Uh, these were transplanted and they actually did really well from being transplanted. We have okra on the right and then okra on the top right hand corner of the screen. Again, four sisters with the uh, really healthy corn. And on the left, you can see I've got a chair. Uh, do a lot of observing. Permaculture is really about observing. That's how you learn. You can learn by doing, uh, but part of doing is reflecting on what you've actually accomplished. So sitting down for 20 to 30 minutes allows the garden to sort of settle back in to a period of no human interference, if you will. And uh, you're not, you're not going to see the plants, you know, jumping around, going crazy, and doing things that uh, they hide from humans or anything. But the the animals and the uh, and you the animals, the ability to see how the plants are sometimes responding to uh, the shade changing and all that other th all that other stuff. Uh, observing is just really really important. There's so many minute details we could talk about. Uh, or I could talk about when it comes to observing, but 20 minutes seems to be the like a golden uh, period of time. Once you reach 20 minutes, all the animals, uh, the birds and everything come out and show themselves so you can get a much better idea of what the garden looks like when you're not around. And it's, it's nice to reflect on your work. Here's some cucumbers that are beginning to reach the trellis. Um, the trellis is quite large, covering the entire pond. The pond's being covered really, really well by the water hyacinth that just grows so fast. It was only maybe five little plants when we started, and then by the middle of June, this is June 15th, they've covered over half the pond, and we would use those for mulch, like I said in the other podcast, or slideshow, sorry. Um, again, here's, the, here's that birch tree that's casting the shade on the right-hand side of the screen, center right, and the smaller... Uh, much smaller corn plants as opposed to the ones on the left. They're all transplanted out in the same day, but you can see the dramatic difference in, in growth. Um, 
the ones on the right really only getting maybe four hours of sun, whereas the ones on the left were getting uh, six to eight. More of the four sisters with some squash uh, that are starting to be part of the ground cover. Um, by middle of June, I would think you should have a much better ground cover than this, but the reason uh, it's so sparse is that it, we didn't have it double dug by until you know the beginning of June, so we we weren't able to get that jump start on the seeds that were coming up from the mulch. Cucumbers looking strong again, just another view of those. Let's move on to the next day, which is the 16th. A lot of cherry tomatoes coming up, so they're not being unnoticed by the insects and boring holes, uh, you know, feeding themselves. But they're also creating uh, the requirements for the predatory insects to come along, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Here are some jalapeno peppers. They weren't the healthiest looking plants, but they sure did produce uh, quite a lot of fruit for us. Uh, green guild looking up, sorry, not the green guild, nightshade guild looking towards the green guild. And you can just see how thickly all this growth has come up and how uh, you may end up having an airflow problem with this, these many tomatoes growing this close together. Zoomed out a little bit from... Uh, close to the same perspective, looking up that same main pathway, but you can see where the eggplants were transplanted. They didn't do very well. Uh, they were still trying to recover from all these insects that just attacked them and attacked them every single night. Cucumber flowers. And now we talk about the uh, herbivores and predatory insects. So herbivores are going to increase their population so much quicker than your predators for a number of reasons. First, by just planting a garden, you are providing them food, uh, and all they need is plants. They don't they don't care about having a whole lot of uh, different requirements there. You're giving them their main number one requirement, so their population is going to increase dramatically uh, as the summer comes on. And there's more and more green for them to munch on. You're just you're giving them a field day, basically. Um, Predators, on the other hand, predators, they need to have enough food so they can reproduce. And it isn't until the herbivores look like they're getting out of hand that the predators are going to come in. And that's the theory anyway. That's the theory that when you have the niche requirements uh, met so that you actually have predatory insects living on your property, um, then they'll do, then they'll come come on on the wings basically when you when you just when you think that maybe you should take some countermeasures uh, we let these squash bugs get out of hand and that's because we were hoping some predators would come in that was a folly um, I didn't identify these bugs immediately like I should have I should have immediately started throwing them into the pond and feeding the goldfish with them which we eventually did uh, but because it's a new garden doesn't have the nectar doesn't have that population already there uh, you're waiting for something that's not going to come. So we had to manually remove these squash bugs later on. Um, taken from pretty much where I took the last photograph from, just I just turned around and snapped a shot of the four sisters in the bottom and the nightshade guild in the center. Uh, the willow tree is responding really well to all the changes we've made. All the trees really have. Uh, they've rapidly recovered from cutting up their... Um, root zone and they're enjoying the organic fertilizer and everything else that we've given them. Again, look at the scale. The scale is really big. Uh, this is a huge garden. I wish I had taken more pictures with my uh, wide angle lens. This is just shot with a manual uh, film era lens. And talking about photography a little bit more with this picture, uh, I was really so new to photography, I was shooting at ISOs 800 to 1600, which is something that you do in low light conditions, uh, not in the middle of the day. So I was maxing out my shutter speed and I wasn't able to uh, generate really crisp, uh, you know, high dynamic range pictures with high contrast by taking these shots that are just washed out. But you can see the growth uh, of the Nightshade Guild here. The photography improves. Um, at the end of 2011 and improves dramatically. Here again, uh, look at this uh, cantaloupe that's trying to act as my living mulch, but 
it's so sparse you can see more of these plants popping up. We'll talk about those uh, probably in the September pictures. Uh, we'll talk about uh, you know just how much damage they did. But in order to suppress those plants and not allow them to germinate in the first place, you need to have a living mulch. And we we didn't. The timing, of course, was just all off. So. Um, Something to consider, cucumbers doing really well. We, re we could have used the cucumbers as a living mulch, but we thought we would be harvesting a lot of cucumbers, so we wanted to be able to access them easier. So I put them on that trellis, and it was a lot easier to get them uh, by stepping into the pond or reaching over there than stepping into our uh, double duck beds. And if you look at that blue bucket that's on the top right corner of the screen, the plant to the next of it is Terahumara chia, and that grew really, really well in our climate. Uh, just it's almost weedy it actually it is kind of weedy if you let it go to seed here's a uh, polyculture in the nightshade guild we've got the peppers lemon balm New Zealand spinach which is bottom left hand corner um, and of course tomatoes and this was just one small section of the garden this did really well uh, this polyculture could have been planted more densely with plants other than tomatoes really could have used uh, lettuce and uh, more onions and that type of thing but uh, as an initial polyculture I think we did fairly well with that. Here is uh, our largest comfrey plant. It was benefiting from being at the saddle of the second soil where the uh, on uh, the part that's not on contour was draining down right to where this comfrey plant was so we got much more water than any of the other comfrey plants did and just showing you how large it is it's probably almost a meter and a half, two meters across, just when it's splayed out, um, going to flower and making those sterile seeds. Here's a willow tree that I grew from just a branch. We would make willow water when transplanting willow water, you just boil new growth and you let it sit overnight and then you dilute it. And when you water the root zone, the growth hormones that are in the willow tree, which is why willows grow so quickly, are transmitted to the other plants and they have stronger root growth. Moving to the 19th, garlic production uh, harvested. Our garlic from the fall, the tops were falling over. This was I just washed these, uh, rinsed them off uh, to get some of the excess dirt away from them. We grew quite a bit of garlic. I was really happy with uh, the harvest. I didn't braid them, I just tied them together and then hung them up in the basement with a fan in order to dry. On the 20th, you can see our determinate tomato looking really strong with uh, the crimson clover beginning to set seed now instead of just flowering. And really great growth, but again, the, uh, the nutrient levels weren't there for it all at one time to actually ripen all these tomatoes, which was unfortunate. But the cherry tomatoes did well. Four days later, on the 24th, those cherry tomatoes ripening for the first time our bell peppers coming on, jalapeno peppers, which were our best because we saved seed from organic grower at the farmer's market and grew those. And here's some fungi that are beginning to emerge after a rain. This is just awesome seeing the fungi come, uh, knowing the power that they have. I wish those were strawberries. They're mock strawberries. It's uh, ornamental from Asia, and now they're... Uh, all over the southeastern United States, uh, dispersed by birds when they eat the little, pretty much inedible berries. I mean, you can eat them, but they don't taste like anything. And this is in the bog area, so there's a lot of organic matter and a lot of water. Uh, great conditions for fungal inoculation here. Just a squash flower. Squash, we had a lot, a lot of squash uh, after we killed the squash bugs and fed them to these guys. Here's uh, some of our uh, goldfish coming up and just nibbling on whatever is growing along the edges of these branches and uh, the water hyacinth and uh, they would eat all the mosquito larvae we could feed them from the other pond. We didn't have any fish in the other pond so the mosquitoes were just laying babies in there and then I'd scoop them up in a net and feed them to our goldfish. Um, last photos, this is the 29th, so middle of summer is beginning, we're almost to July. Uh, the growth here, remember this is almost the same section of the garden that the first photo of the slideshow is, and the, the sunflowers, look how big the sunflowers are, look how thick 
the nightshade guild is, which is the top left-hand corner of the screen. The bottom right-hand corner, the lettuce is beginning to uh, bolt finally. I mean, temperature is 100 degrees. What kind of lettuce is going to do well with almost full sun in 100 degree weather? Some of those onions look like they're putting out a fair amount of uh, leaves. You can see them now, but they the the onion actually the root part didn't grow too well. The bulb. Um, we did a lot of watering because remember I talked about having to put pull back mulch and water since the infiltration wasn't there. Uh, every once in a while, we would fill up the swale from the garden hose, we would run it through the water through a charcoal filter, and then we would have it bubble with the aerator, so we would try to remove as much chlorine as possible before filling these swales. And that was an effective way to um, give a deep watering to the trees and everything else. Another picture of the Green Guild, just structuring with the garlic, the, the different physical plant structure above and below ground. Um, Garlic usually doesn't like a lot of competition, but these did well. Lettuce isn't, it has a lot of roots, of course, but it's not so demanding that garlic can't grow in it. I'm not looking to have garlic the size of my fist. Uh, when you have so much, so many plants, you don't need to have uh, the largest, biggest uh, garlic plants you've ever seen in your life. And our last picture, finally ripe cherry tomatoes. So that was June 2011 in a victory garden. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, hopefully, by the time I make another slideshow, uh, I'll be over this cold. And let me know if you have any questions. Uh, just leave a comment or anything else. And thank